This is my biggest video ever. Today, I'm analyzing Michael Myers from the film Halloween, but not just that. My goal is to make the biggest, most complete analysis of the character you can find on YouTube, right? I'm gonna run some tests, explain the lore behind the scenes. By the end, I hope you know everything there is to know about this character. As always, at the end, I'll give him a villain score 1 out of 10. Trust me, this is one of the videos on my channel you won't want to skip. I put probably way too much effort into it. Let's do it. So this might not go great. One of the main problems with analyzing Michael Myers is deciding which lore tree you want to work off of. Michael Myers has a more robust cinematic universe than the MCU could ever dream of, and that includes the Rhodey variants. There's Halloween, Halloween 2, Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, which has nothing to do with Michael Myers. The villain is an Irish dude. Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers. Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers. Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers. Halloween H2O, 20 years later. Halloween Resurrection. Halloween, Halloween 2, Halloween, Halloween Kills, and Halloween Ends. There's three movies called Halloween, five different timelines, Corey Cunningham, three sequels to Halloween, not to be confused with the third Halloween movie, which is the third movie called Halloween, not the third Halloween, nor the sequel to the second reboot, also called Halloween. It's too much to explain. Uh, it's way too much. So for transparency and clarity, I'm only going to be focusing on the one main Halloween film. I will touch on some of the other films to point out some differences, but like, let's just keep it clean. We first meet Michael on Halloween night, 1963. In arguably the most iconic horror opening of all time, we see Michael from his own point of view as he walks up his stairs, says hi to his sister, and then she says her classic line. Hi, God. This is John Carpenter, director, composer, and the non deborah Hill half of Who Wrote Halloween. The film he made prior to Halloween was The Assault on Precinct 13. Have you heard of it? This is where every character's name in this movie would come from. Michael Myers, actually a real guy. He was the head of Miracle Films, the distributor who released the film in the UK, as well as the Care Bear movie right a few years later who's one of the big stars of the movie it's Lori zimmer right Lori zimmer whose character is based on another writer leah brackett anyone else how about nancy well i guess that doesn't make sense without the last name nancy loomis art director tommy lee wallace coincidence Maybe. Getting back on track, Michael gets locked up in Smith's Grove Sanitarium, where he's treated by Dr. Sam Loomis. Everything is good vibes for a while, until 15 years later, he attacks Loomis and goes home to kill again. So let's get into the question, right? Why does Michael kill? Right, that's what everyone wants to know. Why the hell does Michael Myers kill? Look, this is honestly just my interpretation of it, right? Based on the info we get in the first film. The original sequels would say he's cursed to kill his family. The novelization would say it's because of a Celtic teen, so... Not that. I see Michael as exactly how Loomis describes him, pure evil. He's an idea, a personification. I think it's very telling that the movie doesn't call him Michael Myers, they call him The Shape. Looking at the credits of the film, the only time they call Michael Myers is when he doesn't have his mask on. Loomis only calls him Michael because he's known him without the mask. This version of Michael disassociates from being human, it's the shape of evil. In fact, that's another big problem with some of the other timelines and what they do with the character. They make him Laurie's brother, which completely changes things, and not in a good way. The Shape is scary because it kills at random, there's no reason or logic to why or who he's killing. It's only moving off instinct, where the whole sibling angle, it pretty much just lets you get away safe if you stay out of his way and don't have the last name Strode. It's actually something semi-interesting from the 2018 film, Knock Off Loomis is he wants more than anything to hear Michael Myers speak, to understand him, but sometimes there's nothing to understand, it's just evil. I realized that what was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. On the surface, it might be easy to look at Michael Myers and see him as a character without any personality, but that couldn't be more wrong. There are actually plenty of traits that tell us about Michael's personality, as well as other certain inferences we can come to through observing his movement and strategies, relationships with others. Not having a personality is in fact a personality, let's get that straight. Let's remember that the fact he doesn't talk, the fact that his mask is just a plain mask, those are creative choices made for a reason. A lot of other killers show us emotion, Freddy, Chucky, Candyman, and whenever they show us emotion, it tells us more about their feelings on what's going on around them. When we see Freddy laughing up a storm, right, while killing a girl, we can come to the conclusion he probably enjoys that kill. He enjoys the process. Michael, we have no idea what he feels about killing, and that's because there's no reason. So let's not try and understand it. All of these other villains, you can throw an adverb down next to the phrase, he kills, Freddy kills happily, Chucky kills angrily. For Michael, there's no adverb. All we need to know about him is the fact he kills. 
It works pretty well when you analyze exactly why he moves slow again, something that has to be intentional. Not only would him running convey emotion that he's eager, that there's some urgency here to kill, walking takes that away. It's almost representative of the looming threat of death, a fate that's constantly chasing after us. Run, hide, fight as much as you want, it's still gonna arrive. That has to be right right? Because if not, he's just making things hard on himself. Or is he? In a tight space, when accounting for getting tired, is walking the most effective path of killing? I tested it out. This is my brother Randy and my cousin Remy. Randy has 60 seconds to avoid Remy in the Michael Myers mask, who's only walking around to see how easy it is to catch him. Let's see how it goes. And go. But you can't. You have to. You have to walk. <laughs> There's no diving though. Just, uh, just. Uh, that, was, that was a close one though. Oh no, diving. All right, that's time, that's time. <laughs> we ran this test a few more times. We switched roles. Michael Myers, he only won once. The runner won twice. That's, that, try to say that three times. <laughs> but there's another big aspect of the character we're forgetting, and that's the stealth. Michael Myers is one of the most stealthy horror villains probably ever. Why? Because he's not flashy. We have to remember the time period in which this movie came out in relation to other slasher films. Of the big franchises, he's pretty much the oldest outside of Leatherface. Coming before Freddy, Chucky, Candyman, Ghostface, all those guys. A lot of those other killers have some big flashy thing about them, right? Or even like their slasher gimmick. But there's a simplicity to Michael that makes him maybe the most realistic. Of course, there's the whole personification of evil thing, but right now we're just talking about his main relation in the movie. Freddy, it's a little bit different because Freddy, just don't sleep and you're good. I know easier said than done, but still. Chucky, I'm sorry, but once you know he's evil, I've never found him that intimidating. No, oh, he has the strength of a grown man. Still, dude, like, you know, I'm putting that guy. Leatherface, don't go to Texas. Problem solved. Unless you're going to HTO, dude. Texans, uh, you guys, you guys got a good one there. That place is fire. I can already hear you saying in the comments, Haddonfield isn't a real place. Nothing to worry about. But what I'm saying, right, is Michael is still the most realistic in the sense he's a guy in a mask with a knife. When you imagine a guy breaking into your house to slice you up, you imagine someone like Michael. You don't imagine a big fat Texas guy with the skin face on his face. If you do, you need real help. Now, I'm not just hating on these people because of their gimmicks. There's a very real and good reason for that. And that's that the scenes and the kills and all of that and just the general atmosphere, it can get so much more creative when you have that creative quality to you. I mean, dude, Freddy, Pennywise, all those guys, they give us some of the most creative kills in film, it's amazing. So what's the fix? How about just damn good filmmaking? I'm not gonna discredit the other films for not being visually interesting because they are, but damn dude, John Carpenter, he directs the shit out of this movie. As well as cinematographer Dean Cundey, I wanted to get him some credit, uh, the dude's a beast. Roger Ebert talked about it in his initial review and he spoke about one of the things Carpenter did really well here and that's the use of space. In film, there's three areas of space, foreground, middle ground, background. With Carpenter using all three levels with Michael, it establishes almost this game of Where's Waldo because it opens up the possibility that Michael, dude could be anywhere. By establishing early on these 10 out of 10 background shots for the rest of the movie, it has you examining every frame, the entire frame, to find where Michael could be hidden. So many horror movies have done this since 1978, and I think a lot of this can be attributed to what John Carpenter did here. It makes him so much more ominous, so much more omnipresent throughout the movie, it's insane. The fact his mask is all white, making it more visible in the dark, that's fantastic. If you've never seen what the movie looks like in black and white, I highly recommend it. Yeah, I just got finished with J Films. Yeah. Yeah, I'll probably be home by that time. No, it depends on, like, if there's traffic and, you know, I just... Oh.
And also let's talk about why this is important to actually be set on Halloween. Halloween itself, it has that ominous feeling, that feeling that you can't really get from any other holiday, a feeling that matches very well Michael Myers. And I think that when we're talking about the whole, you know, the stealth, something's hiding right behind you, Halloween itself as a holiday kind of always incites that feeling. So I think that putting Michael Myers in that environment fits the vibe incredibly well. Something about just seeing him next to Halloween decorations, maybe he's a stranger, maybe he's someone you don't know. And I think that, again, it has that feeling kind of going into the future because when kids walk around on Halloween, they see all these people in these costumes, they're not really sure if these people are good, if these people are bad, if these people are, you know, some jerk teen in a freaking costume, or if they're a serial killer. And I think that that's something that adds to the whole mystique of it. And I think that's why it's important to have this character like actually be set here because the more we think about it, the more it makes sense. And that's why it's important to think about and you know, that's kind of the whole funny thing about the whole entire analysis of it and the stealth. It's masterfully crafted by John Carpenter. Everyone else involved, it's absolutely beautiful because the use of the dark space with that white mask and the contrast of it all, it looks absolutely incredible. And that's what I like about him as a villain. He stands out a lot in that regard and the way that he blends into his environment. You see a lot of the DNA in what he did in so many other villains now because it's just, it's perfect. And that's what makes him so- So many scenes, so many scenes to talk about here, holy crap. Before we even get an opening scene, the credits go crazy. One of the best opening credits of all time, helped of course by one of the best film themes of all time. Those high notes are of course the most iconic part, but those lower synths, those real deep ones, dude, dude. The high notes are more intense and fast paced, nerve wracking. And the low chords give you that haunting feeling, that feeling something's hiding behind you, something or someone. They perfectly set up the mood. The opening has been talked about endlessly, so I'm not gonna touch on it too much. But like I said earlier, easily one of the best openings to a movie ever. My one critique that a bunch of people have had with this, you know, they have sex in like 10 seconds. What the hell is this? What is this? The climax to the famous Jim Carrey film, Once Bitten? Once Bitten fans rise up, leave a comment. A lot of the other scenes in the middle of the movie are just setting Michael up. He's creeping at Laurie in class, creeping at Laurie on the street, creeping at Laurie in her bedroom. Dude likes to creep. What a freaking scene, dude. It does a few things for the movie I really like. It shows that mostly, he doesn't kill kids. In fact, let's talk about that for a second. Let's talk about kids. Just like a lot of things about this character, we never really have gotten a clear answer on why he doesn't kill kids. Some have theorized that it's because they're not a threat to him, but I don't really like that. He's not a freaking dog, dude, right? In fact, I don't think anyone in this movie is a real threat to him, but he kills them. In the 2018 film, he does kill a younger dude who might be a teen, uh, but he also has a gun, so maybe it's like predator rules. So if a baby points a gun at Michael, that might be a wrap. But also, like, what what's a kid, right? It's not like Michael Myers is walking around carding people. Like, once you turn 13, you're on the death list. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, I'm, I'm a kid. You don't you don't kill kids. I'm, a, I'm only 12. Hey, I, hey actually... Dude. <laughs> yes, dude, yes. And, and you're not born on a leap year. Nope, no, mm -mm, no leap year. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, because I, I don't kill kids, so I, I guess I'll just, I'll just, I'll go on my way. I, dude, it's good you didn't come tomorrow. It's my birthday. Uh, uh, oh, you said. Oh, fuck. Huh. Uh, what time is it? In like an hour. Huh. All right, well, um, this is awkward. Yeah, that's a pickle. That's a prickle. Uh -huh. Well, uh, I, you got any plans after this? No, no, just, uh. Probably just kill some more people. How about you? It, I mean, well, oh, yeah. I'm no, sorry, it's fine. Sorry, it's sorry. fine. No, it's that's on me. No, it, it's me, good. So, yeah. I mean, you don't have no, to. No, okay. yeah, you're gonna. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Huh. Um. Uh, oh shit. Oh, okay. okay. Well, yeah, that's fine. Okay, know. let's do it. But when the movie switches to nighttime, dude. One of the things I like about the ending of this movie is the whole Halloween night portion. It's incredibly well paced. Cutting back and forth between Laurie, Loomis, and Michael, it's done so well, especially because we know where this is going. We know it's going to end with all three of their stories converging in the finale, and surprisingly, 
they're entertaining along the way to get there. Of course, Michael has the most riveting moments as he hunts down the members of Lori's friend group. And while Loomis never meets Michael again until the end, his portions are entertaining because this is where we learn more about Michael, which in turn makes Michael's scenes better as well. The highlight of Loomis's scenes is of course this legendary monologue about the darkness and the devil's eyes. Donald Pleasance goes ballistic. Lori's scenes are a little slow as she's just watching the kids, but every once in a while the movie's like, all right, we gotta cook. And then they drop one of the hardest shots of all time. Like, what the hell? Like, Michael has to know he's setting these shots up to look to look sick, right? He has to. This looks good, right? Yeah, this looks good. Oh, wait, no. Okay, no, or what if I was closer? What if I, like, do a little, do a little, what if I get lower like this? Like the corner, oh, oh gotcha. Oh, peek out, oh, peek out, gotcha. Yeah, what if, they, what if they can't see you from here? Um, okay. other side, other side, that'll work. Peek out. No, man, I'm a little tight, actually. Okay. Hmm. Um, what about, like that? Get stabbed, fool. Get stabbed. Get, st get stabbed, punk. Yeah, let's try the corner. Okay, that's pretty good. That's not bad. I like that. A lot of these kills Michael has are all iconic now. And dude, we even have a few rare glimpses into Michael's personality here. Let's talk about the ghost kill. Couple is having sexy time. And bro goes down the stairs. There, he runs into Michael. He pins him up against the wall because classic. I don't care if it breaks the laws of physics. It's awesome. Here we get the classic Michael Myers head tilt. Hell yeah, dude. Again, the small touches, the small flares, the flourishes. Meanwhile, girl is still upstairs waiting to resume her adult activity. Michael comes back upstairs uh, in full ghost boyfriend cosplay. She gets hyped, then Michael gets hyped, then she gets killed. Here's what I'm getting at, right? It's important to remember that Michael isn't just this murder zombie. He clearly thinks about what's going on around him as we see him pull off different strategies, approaches while trying to kill these people. I don't think he's doing this to be funny. Definitely not. Not in a way that Freddy probably would do it. He does it because it's an effective strategy to get the kill. It just so happens to be kind of funny for us. But on a deeper level, I think it does make him more intimidating because it shows he's not stupid, right? I think some people might have that impression of Michael, like he's just some dumb big guy walking around with a knife, and he's not. When it comes to the actual finale, finale of the movie, it does a wonderful job of delivering what the film promises. And that's this final confrontation between Lori, Loomis, and Michael. Lori finds Michael's arts and crafts display all around the house, and then the movie just throws iconic shot after iconic shot at you. It's amazing, like legit, it's amazing how many iconic shots are all fit into this finale. It's just wild. Probably the best shot in the movie, one of the best horror shots, of all time is Michael emerging from the darkness of the closet? You might expect it now, but I can't stress just how influential this shot is. Perfect, and so many of your favorite horror movies take after this shot and everything else John Carpenter does in this movie. The next shot, dude, is so sick. When Laurie is trying to get into the house and then every few seconds, they cut back to Michael to see how close he's getting. It's a pretty sick framing device for tension and is a testament to the film's editing. For every second Laurie is at the door, we're waiting waiting for that reverse shot of Michael. We're hoping, we're praying he's not getting too close. We see this a lot in horror video games also, you know, just waiting for the door, getting chased by that stupid baby in Resident Evil. You turn around, right, real quick, just to see how much time you have. It's sensation. Dude, what the hell? What kind of sick, evil genius comes up with a shot like this? Holy f Dude, my guy, the background. I love this shot to death. Michael walking up the stairs behind them. The movie doesn't treat you like a baby either. They know you see it. They don't have to let you know he's walking up the stairs. I swear, dude, visually, this finale is actual lunacy. Most of the shots in this finale would be the best shot in most other movies. The closet sequence is sick, swinging light, always goes crazy. But then, alas, maybe Laurie gets him. Until holy background, Batman, the Myers core rise goes crazy. It's a small touch, but it goes a long way. Humans don't set up like this. Everything in this finale going the extra mile to make this guy not seem human. Furthermore, we see it when Loomis eventually storms into the room to shoot Michael. He doesn't run. He doesn't try and fight. He just sits there and takes it. Of course, he falls off the ledge once he gets shot and the order of events that happens next is really crucial. Lori asks Loomis if Michael's really the boogeyman, to which he says yes. From there is one of my favorite music cues of all time. When Loomis looks down to see Michael's corpse, 
and it's gone. And then we cue that iconic theme. The film then ends with some still shots of Haddonfield and all the locations we've been through throughout the movie. As the music plays and Michael's breathing can be heard. It's not a hopeful ending. It's one that all but slaps you in the face that Michael's still alive. That he could be anywhere at any moment. Maybe even right behind you. When discussing Michael, it's always good to remember to think of him the way the movie wants you to. The boogeyman. The shape. The embodiment of evil. And just like Michael Myers... Evil is always around. It might leave for a time, but it's always behind you, ever approaching whether you like it or not. Maybe not moving fast, but moving closer all the same. It's hopefully not as literal as Michael Myers, but we all know evil in our lives. Evil in some shape or another. It just so happens this is the shape of evil Haddonfield's dealt on Halloween night. It might seem gloom to focus so much on evil, to highlight, you know, the reminder of evil in the shadows waiting, but it's movies like this that make you see the good so much more. Just like the mask in the shadows, it is that black and white. You need one to see the other. And that's why I enjoy horror movies, honestly. That's what I enjoy about this movie. On the surface, it's a guy in a mask going after a babysitter, but if we look deeper and really try to find something more, it can be incredibly profound. This is why I like Michael Myers so much. He's unique, scary, interesting, and everything we want in a character. I know I joked a lot about the other timelines in this video, but I'm always interested in those movies. I'll always be interested in whatever form Michael takes shape. Because even at the worst of those franchises, they try to say something about Michael we might not have considered. They try to say something about evil. Every version of Halloween is a director and writer trying to say something not necessarily about Michael, but about evil through the shape of Michael Myers. I don't think that's hard to see. So like other villains, like the Joker, I don't think we'll ever stop getting new versions of him because even today we get new versions of evil. We see it take a new shape. This is one of my favorite movies of all time. One of my favorite villains of all time. Of course, I'm gonna give Michael Myers a 10 out of 10. Thank you so much for watching, like I said, and I promised my biggest villain review I've ever done. I spent so much time on it, and I spent some money on it too, so I'd really appreciate if you shared it, you liked it, you did all that stuff. The better these big videos do, the more I can make, so, you know, really help a guy out, I'd appreciate it. I want to make more videos like this. Thanks to everyone that helped out with the video, I really appreciate you guys. Let me know in the comments who I should review next, and I'll see you around. Hit subscribe. Happy Halloween!